Hi, so today I'm going to have a look at this um, Casio projector. Now you might be thinking a projector is a bit mundane, everyday sort of thing for um, one of my teardowns, but um, the reason I wanted to look at this is it's got an unusual light source. This actually uses a laser based light source. Um, most projectors use um, high pressure mercury discharge lamps like this this one and these have a few disadvantages one is yeah they've got mercury in them the lamp life is relatively low it's typically between about two to five thousand hours they produce a huge amount of heat and ultraviolet so they need a great yeah they need a ton of airflow to keep them cool and the ultraviolet can actually damage the plastics over time these projectors made some tech news a while ago because back then blue high power blue laser diodes were very expensive these have got an array of high power blue laser diodes as part of the light source and people actually found that they could just buy these new, strip all the laser diodes out and actually sell, you know, sell them on for a profit. And one of some companies sort of bought you know, huge numbers of these just literally to strip the diodes out of them. But I haven't found any detailed technical information online about the actual details of the optical system, which is what I was interested in. So this was like really cheap on eBay. It is actually it does appear to be fully working, although it's very dusty. It's probably had quite a long um, life compared to the sort of discharge lamp based um, projector. These claim a, a lifetime of about 20,000 hours, four to, sort of four to five times the uh, lamp life of a standard projector. So for sort of long term installations, that's a, that's a big advantage. First hurdle is that these use these annoying um, tri-wing screws and they put them down a long hole so although of course you know, you've got sets of um, bits for these reasons enough to get hold of when they're down a hole you can't you can't get them in there so quick fix for that is just to take the bit and saw a little slot in the back so you can just drop this down the hole and then use a normal flat blade screwdriver to uh, get the screw out One slight mystery on this is this little side panel here, which is clearly designed to be fairly easy to remove. There's no warranty seal or anything on it. And that just, it's not at all obvious what this is for. I couldn't find a manual for this model to there's any info, but the three sort of thread seal screws, I can only assume it's maybe some sort of mechanical alignment um, thing for the optics assembly. Um, doesn't really seem to be anything down, down this hole. So inside, um, it's actually quite a bit of space, it's not as packed as um, some projectors I've seen inside of. Um, there's still quite a lot of cooling fans, there's sort of two fans here and another one here, but these are sort of normal fans, whereas the uh, lamp-based projectors tend to have sort of centrifugal blowers, because they need sort of very high airflow rates. Got a single PCB here, the uh, DLP is, is down here, and the optical path, basically we've got the um, laser diode array here, some optical sort of magic in here which we're going to take a look at then goes down across onto the DLP that then projects out through the, um, the lens this way. And no major surprises on the PCB, there's a couple of um, TI branded DLP chips. Um, on the top I think is an analog front end and the left hand one will be the, all the processing for the DLP modulation and stuff. Um, next to it is a big flash chip. I have a feeling that Certainly the earlier DLP chips were actually FPGAs, I don't know whether that's still the case or whether they've uh, gone to a full custom uh, chip on there, but um, if it's an FPGA that might explain the um, that memory next to it. At the bottom there's some unpopulated areas um, connected, that's also connected to an unpopulated USB and Ethernet connector, so that's for versions that have on board sort of networking and things like being able to play Excel spreadsheets, standalone, that sort of thing. And the chip on the right is just a general purpose process so that handles all the user interface and um, other uh, low level stuff. One thing that is a little bit, little bit of a mystery is this chip here. Now just looking at the pinouts and the markings on the PCB, I'm pretty certain this is an accelerometer. Now, you know, why would you have an accelerometer on a projector? I suppose you know, it could be to automatically to take which way up it's mounted, but that's all manually selectable. So um, that's a bit of a mystery. If anyone knows why you put an accelerometer in a projector, please let me know. And on the other side of the PCB, there's this big Panasonic chip connected to the um, HDMI port. So this is clearly the HDMI receiver that probably also handles all the um, HDMI, H HDCP, DRM bullshit, power stuff. Not really a great deal else. That's probably an Ethernet Phi next to the um, RJ45 connector. And the DLP is actually on this board here, heatsink on the back. It's the board here with some of the analog input connectors. One nice thing which is sort of fairly unusual in this sort of thing is a lot of the connector pins and test points are actually labelled. Obviously you need to figure out what they actually mean, but if you're doing any sort of reverse engineering or repairs, then 
that could have, actually give you a fairly sort of significant head start. So for example around here we've got the yeah, interrupts and I squared C pins labelled on the, this chip here which I think is an accelerometer. So as they were kind enough to provide the test points it would be rude not to have a look at that I squared C data around the um, accelerometer chip. I've got this in table mode just because the timing is a little bit jittery it's a bit hard to sort of track and follow um, what's going on so if we look at these values down here these reads these are all sort of moderately stable with a little bit of noise but if I tilt the projector upwards you'll see that bottom one is changing quite noticeably so this is definitely just doing a tilt or orientation detection don't really know what for now on the bottom side we've got this cover with a warranty sticker on it so this is the um, laser assembly so this is designed to be a, a replaceable item these use another slightly oddball screw type which is a, a stud with some um, notches but I found uh, like a, a standard nut drive actually gives enough grip to be able to undo these quite nicely uh, the other trick for these screws if they're too tight to get with the nut drive is just use a pair of uh, needle nose pliers just to start it once it's loose you can then uh, do the rest with a uh, nut driver and this whole laser assembly lifts out so you can see we've got an array of 24 laser diodes here just a ribbon cable assembly and then here we can see a, a mirror array so that the other the, it goes across there and then directs them all into the same place we'll put this back for the moment so we can fire it up and uh, have a play well, there's a couple of covers over the optical assembly the main one's this one so if we lift this off you can actually see a bunch of mirrors lenses and so on some of the these lenses are actually sort of loose in here they're actually retained by the, uh, the top cover and you can see we've got a couple of um, dichroic mirrors in here and a couple of mirrors at the back and various lenses and this little wheel which is covered in a phosphor that turns blue light into white well, I think it's actually primarily using that for green if we shine a blue laser at it we see it glows very brightly with a very greeny greeny output so that that phosphor, phosphor is probably tuned to produce the maximum amount of green now what this optics assembly is doing is sort of producing a sequential red green and blue light to hit the DLP and the DLP then um, sequentially does the red green and blue frames here this is a high power red lead so the red comes down here through straight through this dichroic mirror because this is tuned to pass red and um, reflect other colors through this lens reflects off this mirror and then goes into the optics assembly the blue will come through here from the laser assembly through this lens and through the gap in this wheel so for when it when it's doing blue that's when we'll have this gap in the wheel goes through here across here bounces on here and then into the optics assembly and then for the green the laser will hit that phosphor reflect back here across here and then down here into the assembly now the fact that there's a fairly small gap here I wonder if that means that the green is actually done for a relatively long period of time perhaps that's the least efficient color so it needs to have a longer exposure time but um, and if we have a quick play around with some laser pointers to show the effect of the these optics so this one here we can see that the green gets reflected you can see that the some the beams now on the bottom of the cavity I move it towards the mirror we're now seeing the reflection moving back in the opposite direction across the cavity on the right uh, red also gets reflected again you can see the dot moving off to the right whereas blue just passes straight through and you can see it on the left there and again on this one blue passes straight through which is what you expect so the blue path is going this way green reflected because again where the green is coming down here and being reflected across down here and reflected across here so we can see that's being reflected we've got a much brighter dot on the left red goes straight through it and blue blue also passes straight through there's also this diffuser this is at the exits from the um, laser mirrors so this is just blending those um, blue beams together a little bit I think 
Needless to say, this is a very powerful laser ray, which is highly dangerous. It will set fire th to things and it will burn your eye out immediately. So um, I wouldn't advise you to do this unless you really know what you're doing. And this is what it looks like when it's running up. I've had to put the camera in manual and shut the RF right down because it's so bright. Um, I've also had to play around with the shutter speed. If I go to a faster shutter, the fact that these um, the LEDs are strobing obviously it produces all sorts of weird effects. But if I go to 125th, that's fairly stable. So you can see we've got the red, red light from the LED here. We've got the blue coming through here. And in fact, this is, part, this is just like a little wooden stick. And if you put that in there, it fairly soon starts burning. So that's uh, clearly a rather powerful uh, blue beam there. You can just about, it's a bit hard to see, you can just about see the white, yeah, what looks like a white spot on the edge of the wheel where the blue laser is hitting it. We can see the blue sort of passing through here. And there's nowhere we actually get the green on its own. Because it's always mixed with one of the two colours. But as you can see the different, just about see the different colours as it passes through the optical system. Um, this looks a slightly yellowy white to the eye when it goes through here. And again, that's even here, it's powerful enough to uh, produce smoke quite happily. Now the actual lead drivers and controls seems to be on the um, power supply board and the uh, just poking around the connector that goes to the power supply board just to see if there's any obvious signals that could give an indication of the um, duty cycles. Um, there's actually a few serial streams on here. They're sort of then able to like RXD, BG, TXD, BG, so that's presumably for the blue laser for the blue and green. I don't see anything obvious for the red in terms of the labelling, but so we've got one stream there that's sort of changing periodically. This one looks like this might be timing related, so that's maybe an enable for one or more colours. Another serial stream, so maybe this is just a response from the driver. Another one here, so maybe there's um, a microcontroller in charge of uh, the red and the blue separately, separate microcontrollers. Again, we're getting a few pulses of varying widths, maybe those are enabled. Yeah, there's a cycle of three, so we've got one, two, three, one, two, three, a similar length, so we've got different length pulses, presumably for each colour. I'm also wondering if a reason for having this sort of very long stretch of phosphor and a short gap for the red, um, for the red and blue, could also be to do with heat. I'd imagine that amount of laser power hitting this phosphor is going to produce a fair amount of heat, so by having the longer length then that distributes the heat over a uh, longer area of the uh, wheel. And this is the power supply board, it's a fairly conventional switch mode power supply. And at the end we've got these two driver boards. Each of these, um, these are sort of soldered in to the main PCB. Um, there's a DSPIC33 processor on each one, which seems maybe slight overkill. This one here drives the uh, red LED. It looks like it's just a simple buck converter. There's a couple of MOSFETs here and an inductor. Um, not much else on it apart from the processor. This back one is to drive in the blue lasers. There's three fairly big MOSFETs and some smaller SO8 MOSFETs on there, and again the um, DSPIC33. Imagine these are probably the programming headers for the PICs. And the blue laser board, there's just some filtering on here. There's no, and there's an FFC connector that goes down to the um, laser module here. So I managed to get the whole optical assembly out. This is obviously um, this is a casting, obviously to maintain alignment. Obviously it's, it depends on very um, accurate optical alignment, so the whole th all the actual parts in the optical path are bolted to the same lump of metal to prevent to um, keep everything nice and stable. There's a little board on here, which I'm guessing is a light sensor to monitor the output of the um, optical system. Yeah, there's a little uh, optical sensor there, there's probably a little um, beam splitter in there to divert some of the light downwards onto it. So it can measure the optical power, maybe adjust to maintain constant um, brightness over the lifetime. And if we take the lens off, we can see the front of the uh, DLP in there. Some mirror down there, so I think the light comes sort of off here, bounces down here towards this mi this mirror here, and then onto the DLP, and then up through to the um, through the lens. And this thing here that was on the side, accessible via that flap, 
appears to go to the back of the mirror so that's probably very fine adjust for the um, position this mirror to send to the beam probably uh, through the lens maybe just loosen these screws and then sort of wiggle it and then tighten them up again I don't know I'm not gonna I want to probably keep this projector working so I will don't think I want to touch those and this is the actual um, DLP board there's a fairly big heat sink on the back I'm not sure how much of that is due to the heat generated by the DLP versus just the energy hitting it from the um, the light source probably maybe a mixture of the two power management chip on there a few inductors I think the DLP uses quite a lot of funky voltages so there's probably sort of high voltage drivers and stuff on here another Texas Instruments chip and the package is actually a sort of pinned short little pins that go into this um, and this is held against the front of the um, optical unit obviously this needs to be held in um, accurate alignment so these align with pins inside the uh, back of the optical block and the fans on here are fairly clogged with dust um, it's not that easy you know these there's no easily swappable filters you have to get quite deep into it to clean these out which isn't great I think some of the the lamp based projectors probably have more easily replaceable filters because there's much higher airflow but um, so these ones they seem to have assumed that these things aren't going to need cleaning out but um, this one clearly does it's quite clogged obviously different environments will have different amounts of dust in them this one's clearly been running for quite a long time <coughs> I've got it back together and working and it looks like um, this has been running for about 6,000 hours so that's probably a little, little bit more than a lamp based projector but so if that's the amount of dirt that it got in 6,000 hours it's not nominal rating of 20,000 um, it's going to be pretty filthy but obviously this might be running in a sort of fairly dusty environment and this is the uh, red lead module so there's a just a top cover of the lens and it looks like the die is bonded straight onto the PCB and there's a little thermistor off to the right there just to uh, monitor the temperature and needless to say this is insanely bright uh, if it, leaving it out it does the projector does actually shut down presumably because the um, light sensor is not seeing the, um, the red and looking at this laser module there's a retainer plate that holds this glass lens array and it's interesting there's actually a crack in this and here we can see sort of fairly conventionally packaged laser diodes interesting they're not all populated there's only actually 19 populated in this one and these are mounted directly onto the um, flex PCB no, I don't think there's any point in taking this apart, apart much further so um, these screws have got a lot of thread locker on them and um, some of them are just shearing off rather than unscrewing but I think all we're going to see is just a bunch of laser diodes soldered onto this um, flex PCB so I don't think there's anything uh, particularly exciting to look at here so I've got this thing um, back together all working again and uh, only a few screws left over but they always put too many in these things um, but yes, yeah, interesting bit of tech. You know, quite a complex alternative to a lamp, but with you know, obviously lifetime advantages, particularly for locations. You know, if you've got a projector that's screwed to a wall somewhere, if you can get four times the lamp life out of it, that's um, obviously a good thing. I don't know if any other manufacturers are um, doing this now, whether it's a Casio specific thing or I. I do believe that um, some large scale projectors in like cinemas are using like a central laser distributed through fibre to um, local projectors to provide um, lighting. I think blue laser diodes are now cheap enough that you don't need to start scavenging them from um, projectors although I think I only paid about 40 quid for this thing so it's probably uh, not too bad so it's probably still sort of fairly economical if you can pick the projector up um, cheap enough <laughs>